Hey everybody, it's Kelly. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Therapist. Today we're talking about coming out later in life and the grief that comes with it. Since my grief video is soon to be getting a really big following right now, I want to kind of call attention to something that doesn't get talked about a lot. When you are somebody who realizes who you are later in life, and by that I mean at some point in your life later than when you began your romantic journeys, you realized a truth about yourself that does not match the truth you began with. I might have made that more confusing. So basically, you're a teenager and all of your friends are dating, so you start dating. If you're a teenage girl and you start dating guys, you assume that you're straight. I mean, the fact of heteronormativity means that most people assume they're straight until they realize differently. And depending on what you're exposed to and who's around you and what language you're given and the ways that your family and people around you sort of deal with the world, you might not even know that not being straight is an option until your late teens, your 20s, your 30s. And beyond, because just because you know it's an option doesn't mean you know it's an option for you. So when you do figure that out, the assumption is you are going to be elated to finally step into who you are and live the life that you should have been living all along if you had grown up in a different place. And and many of you, through therapy, maybe through seeing these videos, have come to a place where you understand that your journey is your journey and your timeline is your timeline. And it doesn't matter how long or short it takes you to do what you need to do for you as long as you are being the most real and true you can be. But what many people don't seem to do, either because they don't know it's necessary, because they don't think they have permission to do it, or because they're afraid it takes something away from the trueness of their realization, they don't grieve. They don't feel the sadness and instead they internalize it and make it sort of a weapon to keep themselves on whatever path they think is best for their lives. I would much prefer you grieve. I mean, honestly, grief is not a bad thing. Feeling sadness for something that is over or for something that never happened is okay. That is a very, very common occurrence. It's also common a lot of times people to push it away because not a lot of us got training on what it's like to navigate grief in a way that gets you to the other side. For some of us, our first interaction with grief is something life-changing. A loved one is no longer here or something that was really, really important to you is is no longer part of your life. Those types of grief can really leave marks on our lives, like a pivotal point in our lives. And, and those should be there and should be felt. There are other things that are not as easy to pinpoint. And one of them is the grief that comes with coming out later in life. Now, as most of you know, I don't love the later in life term because I think it sets an expectation that people understand this stuff about themselves early and they don't, as many of you watching this know. Or even for people who do realize it about themselves earlier, they're not in a place where they can self-actualize and live into that truth until later. That said, later in life is a common phrase and it's an acceptable phrase. It's just not my favorite phrase. One of the sources of grief typically comes in your first relationship after realizing who you are, and getting into the type of relationship you want to be in. That can also come with some grief, some sadness about the time that you didn't have, the sadness of the ways that you've had to sort of act in the past in order to be acceptable to society and not be able to be you and truly and deeply invest yourself in a relationship with others. Whether it's a friendship, whether it is a romantic relationship, whatever the circumstance is, that relationship that gets you to understand how much less authentic maybe the former relationships seem now that you are living more authentically into yourself. That piece of, oh my gosh, that time is gone, or oh my gosh, that mask that I had to put on for so long is still part of me, and that is so much, I hear wasted time, right? The the term wasted time gets said a lot in those times. The grief for the teenager or the young adult that you were when you realized there was something different about you, and you weren't in a place to say it or do anything about it. Spending time feeling that and understanding that that's not okay, that you had to hide who you are, and even though you're not hiding anymore, that can still hurt. Just accepting the fact that it can still hurt is the first step to healing that grief. Grief does not just go away overnight. It's not something that you can just look at and say, oh man, that sucked, and then move on. That's not grief. That's probably sadness. That's probably a lot of other things, but grief is a multiple step sort of process. When we grieve things that happen to us, it is very, very common to take on a responsibility that is not yours to take on. This is where I see a lot of people get themselves tripped up. The grief turns into shame. Shame that I wasn't strong enough to stand against my family's expectations or shame that I 
used that relationship with some of the opposite sex in order to understand who I am now. That shame that comes from that internalized phobia of who you are and what the world has told you about who you know yourself to be and how you live into that and know you're not that, but also feel like you are that that shame can feel crippling. That grief can get you in a chokehold and it is hard to maneuver past it. So a lot of people ignore it. Do you know what ignoring that grief or that shame does for you? It makes sure it stays down for a little while. And then at some point it comes back and it shows up in dissatisfaction in your life, dissatisfaction in your work, excessive need for approval from other people in your life, random irritation at people who remind you of who you used to be. Those places that it shows up then steals your joy in the future. So if we just dealt with our grief and our shame in the moment when it shows up, it doesn't have to then mark your future too. There's another piece of this shame and grief that I saved to last and there's a reason for that. A lot of people, feel guilty over the acting that they had to do in their past relationships because they saw everyone else around them and they're like, oh, they look happy and that relationship looks like mine, so I should also be happy. So you act happy. You act like you want to be in that relationship. You act like your future is certain and you're so excited about it. You act the way you're supposed to act. That is your self-defense against feeling so othered is to just act. And when you realize that you spent so much time acting, you realize that you could probably win an Academy Award if people realize how convincingly you acted for so long. You then put that understanding on your current relationship, on your current relationship that looks the way you know your relationships need to look, and you wonder if you're acting then. Like, how do you know that you're not still acting? Because there was a time when you didn't think you were acting before, right? That's a hard place to be, and that's a hard thing to answer because it's so different for everybody. But what I will tell you is that that second form of acting is typically imposter syndrome. Also, it comes from this understanding or this assumption that being this way, that being non-cisgender, that being non-heterosexual is wrong. Because... If you didn't think it was wrong, why would it be such a big deal if you're not as into a relationship you're in as you think you are? If you get into a relationship, you rush in head first and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing and you're having such a great time and you're just clicking on all these levels and then that wears off and you don't have the sustainability in the relationship, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. That doesn't mean the relationship was fake. It means the relationship does not have what it takes to go long term. Okay, you still learned what you learned about yourself. They learn what they learned about themselves. Once you realize that it's not working anymore, you talk about it. It, you part ways and you move on with your life. There's nothing wrong with that. But somehow when you're either moving on with your life as a queer person from a straight relationship or when you're moving on from your first queer relationship, you wonder if you're doing the wrong thing in a way that you don't wonder in any other time. That comes from internalized homophobia. That comes from the understanding that there's something inherently wrong or unnatural or not quite right about being in a queer relationship. And I'm gonna tell you what's happening for a lot of you that are watching this, right? You're hearing the term internalized homophobia and you're like, nope, not me. I know who I am and I'm proud of who I am. And that's great. Also, if you're finding yourself feeling this imposter syndrome in your relationships, if you're finding yourself in this place of, am I sure this is who I am and what I want for the rest of my life? That very well could mean you are dealing with some internalized homophobia that was so deep down, so buried for you that you didn't know it was there or didn't want to address it being there. And so you didn't until you got in a place where you're comfortable or where you're ready to sort of engage with those thoughts. And those thoughts come back up because your psyche has said, hey, by the way, you need to deal with it. Also possible that you're not dealing with that and your dissatisfaction comes from somewhere else. How do you know? Well, when did your dissatisfaction start? What was going on with you around that time? What sort of feelings and thoughts were you having? And when else in your life have you had those sort of thoughts and feelings? Connecting that and seeing those patterns in your life will help you to know if this is something you're struggling with identity-wise, if this means that relationship is not the one you should be in, or if there's something else going on. Or therapy. Therapy is a good idea too. So many people who come out later in life carry this guilt and this shame over self-actualizing. And you don't have to carry it your whole life, but you do have to tune into it in order to heal it. Because the fact is, it is not your fault that you were born into and grew up in a society that told you there was only one way to be. 
It's not your fault that there are people around you that are saying to you, your experience is wrong because it's not my experience and therefore change or be who we always thought you to be because it makes me uncomfortable if you're not. Those things are not your fault. It's also not your fault if it took you longer to figure this out about yourself. None of this is your fault. I would encourage you to remind yourself of that while you explore what grief looks like for you, how it shows up, how you live into it, how you allow it to just sort of B, you don't have to allow it to derail you in order to process it. There's many ways to do that. It just depends on who you are. But you do need to process it. Processing the grief of what came before, processing the shame when you internalize that grief and make it your fault, getting to the other side of that helps you to live the life that you want to live and honestly deserve to live as a human being. You deserve to self-actualize and to be happy about where you are. And sometimes it doesn't come without processing your grief first. That's it for today. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all next time. And until then, take care of yourselves and each other.